All right, thank you and thanks for organizing all of this. I know enough to not stand between people and lunch, which is why I'm glad Keith is going to go after I am. <laughs> uh, we're going to actually tag team this a little bit to compress it in and talk about a number of the issues. I actually just want to highlight a few things. So in Keith's presentation, it's going to be a little bit more about the detail of what people are more willing to pay for, people overall in terms of the general public, also a special survey that we did here at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, mine was a little bit of a more macro level look. So I'm going to take a very quick look through this in terms of that, focusing on just a couple of things. And we'll see if this advances. Okay. I just want to mention a couple of things. In this actually feeds off a little bit of what the previous speakers were talking about. I was recently at a conference just uh, last week over in DC. And the keynote address speaker, it's a teaching and learning conference. Uh, the keynote address speaker talked about the president's uh, talk. And he, what he really focused in on, what the message that went to us, at least, from this, so this is the message being received by the American Political Science Association in terms of their higher-ups, was that they really liked the idea of uh, President Obama commenting that higher education is similar to a public utility. That's, the, that's what they took from this. And in viewing it as a public utility kind of alters a little bit of the way that we approach it in terms of our politics and in terms of our policy. So with that, what I wanted to do with this was to focus, for the sake of the economy and democracy, it's important to get people degrees was the other aspect of it. So between that, what I wanted to do was try to focus in a little bit on the democracy side. And the democracy side, both in terms of public support and also in terms of what the public is willing to support. In a very brief way, mentioning that Keith is going to get into that a little bit more. And I'm going to skip by a number of the slides here so we finish up on this, can get to a couple of questions and get off to lunch after that. Uh, the combination of these is seen in terms of the priorities. Increased number of college graduates, especially with skills, are going to match the economic needs of a new economy at the associate level, at the bachelor's level, and at graduate level. This is, a, I think I've heard this president talk more about community colleges than I had presidents going back quite a ways. So there's a lot of, all the way across the level, the associates, the bachelors, and the graduate levels, trying to figure out an education policy that's going to match the economic needs, but at the same time, there was a recent report that was highlighted and focused, Crucible Moment, College and Learning and Democracy's Future, that focused that education reform and education push at the national level can't just be about that. It's not just about vocational school trying to develop this. It is that plus doing things that involve developing civic engagement, developing good citizens, well-rounded citizens, all aspects of the quality of life. So there are a couple of questions with some California data that get to these, which I wanted to focus in on. And I said I'm going to go through a couple of these very quickly, the normal disclaimers. Uh, here are the couple of questions. What is the role of higher education in creating next generation of workers, promote economic growth in California? And what's the role in higher education in creating next generation of citizens to improve the economic and non-economic quality of life within California? Those are the kind of two fundamental questions I wanted people to think about. And maybe we can get into either discussion now or reception or some other time as well. The data is from the Public Policy Institute of California. This is just kind of a basic disclaimer that the conclusions are more mine, they're not theirs. The 2010 data is available in the raw data form, so I was able to do a little bit more with that. The 2011 data isn't available that way yet, so it's just some basic patterns, some basic cross-tabulations that are publicly available. Uh, at ppic.org, you can actually get their analysis of all this with uh, a very detailed report about public's perceptions towards higher education. Uh, I wanted to focus in on a couple of things that maybe they didn't. You know, I didn't want to duplicate them. I didn't want to duplicate Keith. I wanted to focus in on a couple of additional things. So here's uh, just that the findings are focused in on that. Let me go ahead and get to some of the basic ones here. Most fundamental question is perception of the institutions of higher education. All three systems within California are rated relatively high. 60 to 70 percent rate them as good or excellent. 20 to 30 percent rating them as not so good or poor. When you first take a look at this, when I first took a look at this, it's like, that's fine. I mean, it's not, it's difficult to get everybody to like you. <laughs> but then when you add that to what President Alexander mentioned at the, just at the tail end of the conversation that they had, in California with a dysfunctional democracy, you need two thirds to be able to pass in almost anything. You're just about right there. It's not a lot of extra room to deal with. So if you already have close to a third of the people viewing us as not so good or poor, then if you just extrapolate that out to ballot measures or you extrapolate that out to 
uh, pressures on legislators or where they see about two-thirds of the California citizens think we're fine. There's not a lot of extra room for us to maneuver there. So if you have a two-thirds majority that is needed within the legislature, all you need is a third that responds to that group, that basic third within California, and then you can see where some of the difficulties come in. So with our when you add kind of the public opinion data to the structural analysis of what is either right or wrong and makes it very difficult within California, everything from our direct democracy process to our budgetary laws, then you can kind of start to see what the barriers are. If you ask a question on there, how many of you like criminals? The percentage is going to be 5% maybe. It's much easier and it's a much more popular thing to raise money to put criminals away than it is to educate people, even if you just look at this, and you're talking about two very popular things. Hardly anybody out there is going to be sympathetic for criminals. Most people are going to like kids. <laughs> Most people think education is a good thing, but not quite as much as they dislike criminals. So therefore, that, that's one aspect of from the macro public, you know, take the lobbying side out of it. From the macro public opinion aspect of it, that's one of the barriers that we have to overcome, is that we aren't quite as liked as they are disliked, as we're competing for a budgetary buy. This is just basically a simple slide uh, which I'm going to skim through. It's pretty much consistent all the way throughout. The CSUs are, you know, we're a little bit more in the good category and a little less in the excellent category compared to the others, but it's pretty much consistent all the way throughout with the community colleges and the UCs. I'm going to skip past that one. Uh, job training and a better uh, life. The simple perceptions are fine, but one of the issues that when you kind of get into the data a little bit more, are also about the importance of college education, the success and purpose of a college education. So I'm going to focus mostly on the first question and a little bit on the second one about the purpose of college education because it's something that the, uh, the data analyzed and addressed in 2011, not in the previous year. So we have actually more data about the other question. And it's something that I think we might want to look at because we can add some value to that as we move down in future years. So for the importance of college education success, the basic one here, do you think college education is important for a person to be successful? And again, we're not quite at that two-thirds level. So with two-thirds being such an important number for California politics, we're not quite there. There's a sizable portion, though a minority, a uh, sizable portion that say it's not particularly important for success. So when we're out there trying to lobby, or when they're out there trying to lobby legislatures, or we're trying to figure out what's going on politically, that's one of the barriers that we come across, is that you deal with at least in California, and this is with 2010 data, close to 40%, 35 to 40%, they like it. They think it's fine. They think we do a good job. You can get higher numbers for that. Is it fundamentally important? We know it is. A lot of people know it is, but not necessarily enough people know it is within California. And maybe that's some of the sales pitch that we need to do as well. Separated this out by a few of the demographic variables. Um, I didn't want to go into too many of them, but I wanted to go into a few that either PPIC didn't or that focused in a couple of things that were politically interesting. One is gender. Women believe it's more important than men do. We see this in a lot of data. More women are going to college than men are. So if we do outreach, one of the outreaches is to go try to find more men to go to college because their numbers are going down. That is reflected here. Importance, this is one from 2010. The 2011 data is actually a little bit different. The numbers here kind of equal out, where this number goes up and that number goes down a little bit. But one thing I found kind of interesting, and people who are more involved in the system than I am can you know, maybe shed a little bit more light on some of the whys for this, the importance of higher education and being successful goes down the more education you get. <laughs> you think about that for a minute. One reason that comes to mind is kind of a basic human nature aspect of people like stuff that they don't have. It's something that people aspire to. So if you see your place in life, and we know that when you take high school or below, some college and college graduate, and you take those categories and you put them towards income brackets, you put them towards unemployment stats, that people at this higher end over here are going to be more likely to be employed. They're going to be more likely to have higher income, higher quality of life, and a lot of indicators. So therefore, people who are striving for that believe it's important because they don't particularly care for the place they are in life, the unemployment particularly right now in a bad economy, and they see this as a route to go. So when you take a look at this, one way kind of, you know, I laugh the same way that a lot of people did in terms of seeing this to begin with, but it also shows us an opportunity. It shows us there is an unmet need out there. And an unmet need that when you went through all the financial data that they brought up the last time, 
about how we are doing a very good, efficient job at educating the people who are most costly to educate and the people who need it the most in some degree. That's this group over here who believes that it's important. That's a base of support that we can reach out to and that we both need to serve policy-wise but can also be a partner politically. Ideology. I mentioned this one in part because, again, the two-thirds aspect. Uh, very liberal people are more likely to believe that college is necessary for success. Very conservative people are a little less likely to. Uh, this is one that when you get into a highly polarized partisan era, it's an important thing. But as the speakers mentioned, it's nothing that I want to put too much focus on because when you get up to the legislature, it's been a democratic legislature pushing a lot of the cuts. So it's not necessarily that this equates perfectly that way. But it is one thing to kind of keep in mind as we move forward and develop future strategies is that the base of support is a little bit more on the left of the political spectrum than on the right of the political spectrum. Doesn't mean that we can't do a better job pushing some of the things that might appeal to the right of the political spectrum. The efficiencies in particular. We do a great job with a little bit of money. That is something that should have appeal over here and maybe is something that we'd be able to push a little bit more. Multivariate analysis is a very simple one uh, of the data when I threw in a lot of other factors as well that were kind of the common ones just to see if these patterns held. They do even when you control for things like income, parental status, you know, parental status meaning do you have kids either in college or people who are or kids that are 0 to 18. So the non-parents versus the parents, there was really no difference there. Uh, when you took a look at some of the other ones, all those factors, gender, ideology, educational level, all of them still held. So they're not necessarily spurious relationships. They really are relationships that hold. It's something that can be instructed. 2011 results are similar for the difference between men and women. For ideology, as I mentioned, or uh, for educational status, it's a little bit different. And for ideology, there's a little bit of a difference between the two years, but not very much. For the most part, those patterns do still hold fairly well. One of the last things I wanted to mention, uh, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Keith in a second, is kind of question of whether the purpose for college was for personal intellectual growth or for skills and knowledge for the workplace. This difference between kind of a liberal arts approach to education, turning people into very good citizens, turning people into well-read uh, individuals, cultural enhancement, all of that, versus kind of the more vocational part. And that's what the question was trying to get at. The option uh, to say both was not given, which was unfortunate, and hopefully in future years they will, even though a lot of people volunteered that. And for, having, for a survey that doesn't have an option for both, for close to 20% to actually volunteer both, I think actually says a lot. That people don't see this as a false choice. And if they ask, actually put this into the survey as an option in the future, my hunch is that number is going to go up considerably. That people view this as a false choice, that it really should be both. Even at that, an interesting pattern came up, which was that for the personal intellectual growth, the plurality is there for college graduates. The plurality is here for skills and knowledge for people who aren't which basically told me that even though I think the survey will be better suited when this part is into the permanent part of the survey, so then we can actually tell where people fall with the categories a little bit better, with that limitation on it already, what this told us is that somehow, somewhere, for the people who go through the systems, for the people who are college graduates, they see something more about what we give than just vocational education. That that's part of it, it's an important part of it, we do want our students to get jobs, they do want to get jobs, but they want a little bit more than that as well. So when we design and when we try to pitch educational policies and we look at curricular reforms, we need to keep some of these things in mind as well and try to resist a few of the maybe easier temptations just to push in for one because that's not necessarily what the data seem to support. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith so we can move on to the next one. He can get into some of the details about what people are willing to pay for, which is, I guess, a little bit more important. Here you go. <laughs> 